Bob referencing Orlando International Fashion Week, we do produce that. So we have a lot of fashionistas following us right now and, and probably watching us right now, wondering. So we see you in these nice suits, but how? what is your inspiration? How do you dress um, when you're not at work? I'm cool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody, I believe we're live. Welcome to First Entertainment Live, episode 17. I'm Rob Henlon. I have my little sister Jessica with me. Hello, everyone. My Hello. sister from another Mr. Thora Dalton. Hi, everyone. It's Fierce Friday. What's Fierce up? Friday. <laughs> I am the man who was self, Matthew Cooley. Matthew. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the game. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> I don't know what we're gonna find out what he dressed out up as today, but um, <laughs> oh, man. but first of all, we definitely need to welcome our Orange County Mayor, yes. Mayor Jerry Deming. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being here, our special guest today. How you doing? Welcome. <laughs> hey, thank you all for inviting me. You know, I'm always excited to engage with members of our community in various ways. This is what I do every day. I have one of the best jobs anybody could ever have. <laughs> Well, we definitely appreciate you taking some time out of your busy schedule. We know you just wrapped up a meeting. You just wrapped up a, a live uh, meeting. <laughs> so um, I, I guess that's your day, just running from meetings to meetings, huh? Yeah, that's part of the, the, the gig that I have. Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Nice. But um, so for those of you at home, every week we do a dedication of our show. And today is September 11th. So um, we're definitely dedicating this show to September 11th, everybody that has been affected by that um, the attack that happened on our, our um, country on that day. And I know everybody can pretty much remember what they were doing at that, that time. Um, so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask the, the team, that's our question for today. What, what you know, let's reflect on, on September 11th. Where were you? What were you doing? So I'm gonna start, I like to start with the lady. I'm gonna start with, with uh, Jessica. Okay, all right, I'll go first. <laughs> okay, so way back 19 years ago, um, one thing that stands out is that social media wasn't like it is now. And I was working um, in an office and we actually got a mass email. <clears throat> and the email said, um, it explained that there was an airplane that just hit into the tower and my mind could never imagine that what really happened you kind of imagine okay a small plane hit it fell there's one person affected you know because you're just reading this email and your mind would never imagine that so we all kind of rushed to the kitchen and started watching tv and just wow we just were in awe with what was happening in front of our eyes yeah. okay. So, Star, do you remember where you were? So I was um, living in Minnesota, and I was at my job, and someone just came um, by my desk and was like, you got to see this, you know. So we ran into this conference room where we had a TV, and we're, we're seeing, like, the news footage and, and the things happening. And even though we didn't understand what was going on, we were just like, our heart was dropping because we knew it was bad. And... This is not a movie. This is real life. So um, I'll forever remember that day. Matthew. So I was actually at work when everything happened. I was actually working at Mac and everything had like transpired and they're like, oh, this had just happened. Like, they had they had said that like um, two planes actually, or a plane had actually hit one of the buildings and we're like, okay, that's super weird because it, Anyone who remembers like Tampa, there's like a few planes that like little like pilot planes that like hits like the like the 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 buildings and everything. So we're like, okay, it's nothing. It's out of the ordinary, but it's not so much out of the ordinary. But then like they 
described like more as to what was happening and we're like holy crow <laughs> wow. so then like my family who's actually from new york they're like calling me just to make sure i'm okay i'm calling them like to make sure everything's okay and then like everything was like transpiring and, like oh here we go kids <laughs> so it was just like a lot of like trying to like you know communicate back and forth with family because th no there wasn't any social media there wasn't so i think like the first social media was like 2003 or something so th there was no communication back then so like you know just texting i'm a little track phone and everything trying to get with family <laughs> <laughs> trying to see like if everything was okay so yeah it was just trying to like get with family to make sure everything was okay but like it was like really stunning because at that point, like once everything like transpired, like I remember the whole store like shutting down, like people being ushered out, and like I remember people being, you know, picked up and from there, yeah, 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 it was a scary time. And um, so, Mayor Deming, so you actually you were on duty because um, for our listeners or uh, watchers that are watching from out of town, um, you served as the Orange County. Um, sheriff, correct? Yes. Well, Orange County um, and Orlando uh, Chief of Police as well. So I think you were the Orlando Chief of Police at that I time. I was the Orlando Chief of Police. Okay. All right. And so, so tell us, could you tell us from your perspective what that looked like? Well, in fact, on that day when I first was notified uh, about something going on, I was at, actually teaching a course uh, to State Department of Corrections personnel on uh, counterterrorism measures. And uh, my full time job was chief of police at the time. And so uh, I had to abandon uh, the teaching that I was doing and uh, really take uh, command of our response from the perspective of the Orlando Police Department. Of course, uh, at that time, the Orlando International Airport uh, was the, the police that or assigned there uh, work for me at the time. Uh, that particular morning, the President of the United States had been in the airways here in Central Florida uh, and was uh, flying back to Washington, D.C. And so as the attack was going on, uh, uh, an order came out um, to mandate that all commercial air flights be grounded uh, immediately. So if there were airplanes uh, in the air, uh, they had to find the nearest airport that could accommodate them and land uh, because they were securing uh, all of the airways once they knew that multiple planes had been hijacked from around the country. Well, one of those uh, uh, individuals who were well, actually a couple of the individuals who were identified as hijackers uh, later originated their flight right from the Orlando International Airport. And uh, they had a couple of automobiles uh, that belonged to them that were parked at our airport. So because of all of that, it pulled us into the uh, national emergency that was going on. And it just so happens that, um, of course, the attackers, the hijackers, uh, they uh, had uh, pledged uh, support uh, to uh, various terror actors from around the country. And uh, one of them was Osama bin Laden. And Osama bin Laden had many siblings and one of his brothers lived here in West Orange County. And so because of all of that connectivity, uh, it was a bit helter skelter here in our community <clears throat> because of the theme parks and everyone right. became concerned about these iconic locations around the country, perhaps being a target. And so we were deploying resources very rapidly to the airport uh, to our theme parks uh, and to our critical infrastructure facilities around the county. So it was a very, very long, busy day for me, a sad day as this obviously unfolded for all of us, a day that I certainly will, will never forget. Wow. 
I, I could just imagine, um, you know, just that weight, <laughs> you know, of, of, of being in charge of so many officers and not knowing what's going to happen and knowing that we're in the middle of, of an attack and, you know, that, that response. Um, so as for myself, it was, it was bittersweet. Um, my daughter was born on the, the day before. <laughs> on, um, oh, wow. On the 10th. Yeah, so um, I was actually two weeks out of the army because I got out because I wanted to spend time with my daughter and um, um, woke up in the morning, put my shoes on, I put the news on. I didn't have the, you know, didn't have the, the sound on, but I saw one of the Empire, the um, World Trade buildings smoking. And yeah. so I'm like, okay, it's, it's caught fire. You know, I wasn't really paying attention because I'm thinking I'm getting ready to, to hurry up back to the hospital and see my, my wife and my daughter. Um, and as I'm watching, I see the other uh, aircraft hit. And then that's when I turned up the, the you know, the volume and I'm like, okay, we're under attack. So I'm, I'm, immediately went to military mode because I just got out of the army, you know what I mean? So I'm like, <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm in the vehicle, I'm looking up in the sky, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that we are under attack, that it's, it's war, you know what I mean? So I'm driving, I'm looking up in the sky, rushing to the hospital. And um, at that time, everybody who wasn't in critical condition, they sent them home. So my, my wife, they sent her right home. And she came home and, uh, you know, then we, we have a lot of family in New York and just trying to get a hold of them. So once again, our thoughts and our prayers go out to everybody who was um, affected in, in any type of way um, in that situation. And, um, you know, interesting to, to hear how much Orlando and Orange County was involved with that, you know, had it played a part in it, which a lot of people didn't know, you know. Interesting. So we're going to lighten up the mood a little bit. Yes. We're going to lighten up the mood a little bit. We're changing gears. Let's please. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, so for those of you, if you're just now joining us, if this is your first time, uh, first at the table, we're a production company. And due to COVID-19, you know, we, we decided to switch gears. You know, we felt that it wasn't, a, 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 it wasn't safe, first of all. I don't want to. I don't want to get in trouble with the mayor. You know, we were mandated <laughs> <laughs> to not <laughs> to not do any events. <laughs> so we were mandated to do any events, and um, um, and we didn't feel that it was safe. We didn't want that responsibility to do anything this year. So we decided to switch gears, and this is what you see now. We decided to highlight entertainers, entrepreneurs, a political, uh, you know, community representatives, and um, other en entertainers in this platform so definitely check out our youtube channels um you know you'll see past events and our past episodes um yes. so may them excuse me i have a question for matthew matthew oh please, please explain what you got <laughs> going on please i think <laughs> every time you know matthew you never know what you're going to get with him so let, let us know what, 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 what do you got going on today Going on where? All of that. All, all of that. I, I'm the one that Matthew dresses like that every day. I don't know. Man. I dress like this every day. This is like my everyday. This, I, I, this is what I dress for, like going to Aldi's and everything. So I'm, I'm ready to go. <laughs> I got my recyclable bag. I'm ready to go. So. Uh, <laughs> so pretty much like what I have going on is like. You know, it's, I do a lot of costuming and everything and I get ready for, you know, I have the scratching post, which I talk about, you know, social media and what's going on, you know, in life or like locally. Um, and then like stuff that I do personally, which, you know, a lot of the people that watch us, they, you know, they connect with me because I do a lot of the costuming or I do a lot of the makeup or I do a lot of the hair. So they have that connection with me. So I, that's what I have going on. I. Okay. I don't necessarily dress like the everyday person, but you know what? This is Orlando. We have our Fusion Fest right here. If you missed last week's yeah. ex ex exposition, this is what we do because we have everything going on. We reach out to everybody because we love everybody. So this is what I have going on. Can I point out a fun fact about Matthew? 
Matthew yeah. also served in the military. He was in the U.S. Army. And I believe he and Rob were like in the same, same um, unit. We were, yeah, not at the same time. Well, we were, we were both in Korea <laughs> in second ID. Not at yes. the same time. I don't, yeah, I, I don't think he would have liked me. <laughs> I don't think you would have liked me. I don't think you like, think you like me now. <laughs> Matt, I see uh, in the background in the room, it looks like a, a witch, uh, a, a witch attire or something in the background. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's, his, that's his outfit for later tonight. Uh, <laughs> No, I have like costumes that I work for with people, and uh, so this is like one of the costumes I'm working on for, um, and it's part, one of the sisters from Hocus Pocus. So everything behind me is like it's always going to be every week. It's going to be something different or, you know, something exciting. So I keep it real. Yeah. All right. <laughs> cool. yeah. <laughs> so I have a question, Mayor Dannings. Uh, you have a, such a wonderful background. You are an Orlando native, and you have a wonderful family. Um, your your wife is amazing as well. I'll just throw that in there. And you are a twin. So can you just tell us a little bit about your background? What that what is that like being an Orlando native and and um, just being a twin and all all of that? Well, I, I'm incredibly uh, blessed. Like like we all are. Uh, I was born and raised here in Orlando, and I'm the youngest of five children, although my twin brother, his name is Terry, he is 30 minutes older than I am. <laughs> uh, I am the son of a twin. My father uh, was a twin. He had a twin sister. My father, by the way, would be 98 years old tomorrow on wow. September 12th. And, uh, you know, the two, um, my mother and father had five children and I just happened to be the, the youngest one. Uh, my family first uh, lived in the Paramore area here uh, in downtown Orlando on Bryan Street, moved out to West Orlando. And that's where I grew up in the Washington Shores area. And a uh, poor kid, you know, that uh, lived in a segregated community, uh, born in the late fifties and uh, just uh, nothing short of phenomenal to have been uh, blessed to graduate from Jones High School here, go to Florida State University and graduate and come back to this community and really start uh, my adult work life. I, I was a, an accountant before I was a, a law enforcement officer. So uh, I went to school at Florida State uh, to major in finance and accounting and came back and went to work as an accountant in this community. Uh, uh, ultimately, I went to the Orlando Police Department in uh, 1981 and uh, did uh, about 21 years with the Orlando Police Department. And, and fortunately, uh, I met my wife there. Uh, we've been married for 30 plus years. And uh, I have a set of twin sons uh, as well. Uh, and uh, my one of my twin sons is uh, a fire battalion chief. He's the only one went into public safety. I have one that teaches school, the high school here, and the other son is in the rental car business. So we have the three sons. Uh, we have uh, five grandchildren, four granddaughters, and one grandson. And um, I was fortunate with the Orlando Police Department to, um, to have worked and served in every rank. And in 1998, uh, was that 30 years or so ago, uh, uh, no, 20, 22 years ago. 22 years ago, I was appointed police chief in Orlando, uh, first African-American, uh, had a wonderful role models that uh, served prior to me. So I realized that I was able to sit where I sat because I was standing on the shoulders of some who went before me. And uh, so I retired from the agency in 2002 and went to work for Orange County, came here as Deputy County Administrator and Director of Public Safety, where I worked for almost six years. Uh, and then I ran for sheriff and uh, was elected sheriff in 2008. I was on the same ballot with, that elected the first African-American president of the country. And that ballot in, in Orange County uh, had three columns, the top left column uh, top line, uh, people voted for President of the United States. 
uh, the top right on uh, column, uh, they voted for Orange County Sheriff. So I was on the same line with the president and I was first African American wow. elected sheriff okay. here in Orange County. Uh, and uh, really the second uh, uh, to be serving as sheriff, second African American uh, in the state to serve as, as sheriff at that time. And uh, I served, I was elected three terms, uh, left that and in 2018 I was elected Orange County Mayor, uh, first African American to serve in that role. So that's why I say I've been incredibly blessed. So that's a little summation of kind of my background uh, for the last 40 years of, of public service. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting. Amazing, amazing story, and, and it's, um, I, I just like to say you are a role model, and I hope that children read your story and are inspired by your story, because you're, you're a great inspiration. And I should have talked more about my wife. You know, I, she's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, by the way, the uniqueness is uh, when I was chief of police, my wife was the captain at the Orlando International Airport during the events of 9-11. Wow. And so, so she was one of my reports. Uh, and uh, she, of course, went on to serve also mm -hmm. as the Orlando police chief, the first and only woman to have served uh, as Orlando police chief. So our family is, is sort of yeah. pretty unique in that regard. Yeah. Uh, right. I don't know that there'll ever be a husband and wife, both mm -hmm. who have served as Orlando police chief, or right. a husband and wife where one served as the Orlando police chief and the Orange County Sheriff at the, you know, the uh, at the same time, you know, here in this community. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, uh, it, that's the stars just align that way for yeah. us. And so she serves now in Congress and we're very proud of her. Uh, she's made some uh, historic uh, accomplishments or achievements since she's been serving in Congress. Up for re-election yeah. today. Uh, so uh, we're, we're supporting her in that uh, re-election bid as well. Yes. With you? She, she With is you? my soror. I just throw that in real quick. She's my sorority sister. Oh. She's my sorority. She is. Yeah. So, you know. So, and by the way, I'm a <laughs> member of Omega Psi Phi fraternity, so that, that makes Watch you out. like my little sister there, too. That's so. right. <laughs> I'm a life member. <laughs> So with you bringing uh, up your wife, I wanted to bring up something. I heard that you and your wife ride motorcycles. Is that true? We do. Uh, okay. My wife has a uh, Harley uh, Davidson uh, motorcycle, uh, uh -huh. full size motorcycle. She has a mm -hmm. Road King Classic and uh -huh. I ride uh, a Harley Davidson electric line, a Screaming Eagle. Uh, so <laughs> that's how we kind of spend some of our free time going out. Just we're free. We get in the wind and uh, ride our motorcycles. That's pretty cool. I ride a, a sport bike, a 600. But yeah, I enjoy it myself. Oh, yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> that you do. Mm -hmm. yeah. do you and your wife ever go to bike week? Uh, we have uh, gone to bike week uh, a few different times. Because of our incredibly busy schedules now, we haven't been to bike week in probably about mm, four years now. Just okay. haven't been able to make it work. Uh, she spends much of her time in Washington, D.C. Uh, and, and not here in the metro Orlando area. So uh, with the new kind of role that I'm in, I, it has taken up an enormous amount of my time. Uh, I, I, one time she was actually headed to D.C. from Orlando. And um, I've, I've met you. We, had, we, we spoke right in front of uh, you came to visit our studio. Um, yes. And I was telling you, my wife was actually on the same flight with your wife. My wife works for the government um, also. So they were on the same. So my wife just, she texted me and she's like, hey, I'm on, a, I'm on the um, same plane, wait, on the same flight with uh, Val Demon. I'm like, well, I'm talking to her. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that, was, she, that was pretty cool. She, she does she don't ride first class. She has to be like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Man. And you guys have like a beautiful love story and a lot of people, I mean, you know, because I, I, I mean, you've been in the news a lot and she's been in the news a lot and we're going to we'll talk a little bit about that coming up. But um, just to piggyback off of what, what Jessica said, you know, you guys both are inspiration. And I, I told you, I, I told you before, I don't know if you remember that, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you. You know what I mean? And I don't know if I told you why, but, um, you know, my background is management and leadership. You know what I mean? But to see, you know, so I, I like to look at different people's leadership styles 
and to observe and to learn, you know, as, as mentors, you know what I'm saying? And to see, I, I know as, uh, as, as a sheriff, regardless of your politics, regardless of your beliefs, you got to treat everybody, you got to lead the same way. Everybody's your, you know, yeah. every, your, everybody, you know, this is your county, you know, you have to lead everybody the same way. Yeah. And to have that perspective, and I see you carry that same, the same viewpoint as mayor, you know what I mean? You don't get into the weeds with any type of politics, but whether it's Democrat, Republican, what's right is right. I know, you know, you, you just, you got sued for <laughs> mandating that everybody need to wear a mask. But I mean, you know, but you weren't looking at politics. You just, you know, this is what's the best, better good for everybody. You know what I mean? Yep. So, so that's why, you know, personally, you know, I wanted to piggyback what Jessica says, and I hope, you know, kids get to hear your story and, and, um, and, and the story of you and your wife, this is, this is a beautiful love story, but that's the reason why, you know, I, I wanted to. Well, I, I do appreciate those words, Rob, because I think when you're in a leadership role, uh, there's an expectation that you are there to unite. You, uh, when I first uh, became chief of police, uh, you know, sometimes when you're put into these high profile positions, people expect favors, they expect uh, you to, uh, to, to sometimes compromise yourself. And, right. and I've been a lawman for a long time and, and I'm about what's right, what's lawful, uh, treat people with dignity and respect because that's what my mother taught me uh, is to respect all people. And so uh, when I became the chief of police, sometimes what uh, people tried to do because I was a man of color was to pigeonhole me into, well, uh, he's just a chief over of uh, the African Americans. Well, no, I'm the chief of police uh, uh, over all the people at that time and serving all the people. So uh, my uh, leadership style has been one to unite. I think if you're in a leadership position, your, um, your responsibility, the words that you use should not divide. And unfortunately, we have uh, too many people in leadership roles whose commentary is divisive and it just divides a community. And, right. and we cannot be the kind of great nation that we are if our leaders in our nation just divide us along right. lines that's not appropriate. That does not mean, however, that I do not recognize the systemic racism that has occurred over time to people of color. I cannot ignore that. So in my position, what I try to do is make certain that I never forget but I uh, bridge the gaps and I create opportunities uh, for people who look like me and who don't look like me to have an, uh, a seat at the table. And so I've tried to reform organizations from within. And there's different, uh, I think, strategies to be able to do that. Sometimes we, we need uh, the civil rights uh, activists and, and right. others uh, to agitate sometimes from outside of organizations. But I think in order to have the best desired outcomes, you got to have someone inside these organizations to try to work to bring about change from within. When we talk about criminal justice reform, it's okay to have people who write the laws, who enforce the laws, but within a law enforcement agency, the agency is much better when it is diverse and reflects the diversity of the community and the people who it serves. And so that's what I try to do was attract uh, diversity within our organizations. Uh, and I'm going to continue. As the mayor, now I get to do that countywide to attract business, to create entrepreneurial opportunities for all people, uh, to make certain that where there were disparities in health care, uh, access, access to quality health care over the years, that I get to work in a field where I get to use this $4.8 billion budget that I'm responsible for to try to eliminate that, to reduce that, to address those issues. Uh, if there has not been adequate access to capital, you know, as a business person, uh, oftentimes the minority and women owned businesses don't have the same access to capital that uh, people in the majority community uh, have uh, access to. So what I try to do is look for ways, how am I going to level the playing field? How will I make certain that 
uh, we get uh, uh, people uh, engaged with some of the contracts and making money from through the different ways. So we, even with the CARES Act funding that we received from the federal government, it was important to me and important to the Board of County Commission that the recipients uh, of those funds represent our community. So, and that uh, the small businesses who are minority and women owned in this community got a piece of the pie. And so I'm happy to say that about 69% of the recipients of those funds have uh, been uh, minorities and uh, 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 about 71% of uh, those who have been, who've gotten business contracts or what have you, uh, have uh, represented uh, small small businesses and minority owned businesses as well. Wow. So wow. this is how I think, you know, uh, in terms of my strategy to make certain that I'm just not here uh, to just occupy space. I have uh, some things that I'm trying to accomplish. Uh, and sometimes, you know, while I'm, uh, a public official, and I'm transparent uh, with what we do with public funds, sometimes the strategy has to be one that you keep closer to uh, your chess. Uh, it's much like a chess game or a card game. If you show all of your hands in advance, then they know how to play against you. So there are some times where uh, we have to be strategic and confidential in, in how we approach certain things to to achieve the success that uh, we're looking for, for the greater good of all people. That's awesome. That's, a, that's amazing. <laughs> that's that's stuff. And, and I mean, and you know, when you think about it, I, I mean, you're, as, as the mayor of Orange County, the county itself is, is completely, there's different pockets of culture, <laughs> uh, I could put it that way, within the county. You know what I mean? If you go, you know, you go one one section of town, you have to speak Spanish. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying right. you go to another section, you know, it, it could be complete. It looks completely different. And then you go out to Christmas, that all that is Orange <laughs> County. You know what I mean? And um, so, so you, you know, so what you do, what you know, is is evident within the community. You you have to be the mayor for all of those people as well. You know what I'm saying? So it's 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 uh it's refreshing to see and and I got a, a little bit of an insight because I you know I'll mention because I'm part of one of your committees um the the Martin Luther King committee and um it's a your initiative that you you decided to to you know bring on to the to the county can you tell us a little bit about that and and why did you feel that that was important Yeah thank you for mentioning that and thank you for your volunteer service. Uh, we know uh, the history and the legacy of Dr. King uh, and his commitment to nonviolence and to making certain that uh, people of color um, had the ability to um, realize the American dream. We know his commitment, but what I found was that in many ways we would celebrate his life and legacy on his birthday or during Black History Month. And uh, it's like we tucked it away and no one ever said anything about it anymore. What I wanted was to make certain that we have a daily, uh, weekly focus uh, on bringing about nonviolence and inclusion uh, all year round, not just in one area of the county, but in all areas. So we impaneled a group of 30 volunteers uh, who are very diverse. They're male, uh, they're black, they're white, they're uh, Hispanic. Uh, they even have religious uh, diversity. Uh, they come from all segments and sectors of the county, uh, representing the urban part of our county, the rural part of our county, the business part of our county, et cetera. And so what I wanted them to do was create the kind of focus where we had a year round focus to uh, provide some feedback and advice to me to make sure that when we talk about public policy, that we institutionalize a public policy that embraces diversity. Uh, some people, when they hear that, uh, uh, some people feel like if you're uh, a white, 
uh, there are some who feel that uh, when they talk about advancement for minorities, that they are losing something. Uh, no, they're not gaining it. There's enough wealth and uh, quality of life to go around for all of us to, to benefit. Uh, when we have crime problems, crime is a byproduct of social problems. And so to me, uh, when we're talking about bridging the gap to make the world a better place for everybody, you have to have, be intentional about that. And so the creation of the MLK initiative here in Orange County was but one of those strategies to make sure that I was leading and providing the kind of uh, intentional change that the community wanted to see. And the best way to do that is involve the community in that process, that decision-making process, because we then become stronger as a community. And every time there's a police shooting uh, of an unarmed black man, there's a little unraveling of the, that strength of our community that occurs. And if we don't constantly work at it, when that unraveling occurs, we get ripped apart. So what I'm saying is, let's be intentional about engaging, putting us together and strengthening that community so that in bad times, we don't get ripped apart as a community. Right. So that, that's very proactive. And along those lines, I'm also honored to be on one of your committees. Um, with COVID, you have formed um, many initiatives, task force, you do many press conferences. I try to watch every single one. Um, and because I work with college students, I've been able to join in on the uh, business compliance, consumer satisfaction, economic task force. I've been able to, to join in those last few meetings and a big initiative for the, um, from what I work with with the younger um, college age students is the initiative to, for people to do their part. There's a hashtag, do your part ORL. For us to hold businesses accountable and then you have your strike team who they're out there making sure that the businesses are doing what they need to, to do to be in compliance. So can you tell us like, how did you come up with that strategy? Well, uh, you know, I have, of course, 37 plus years as a law enforcement officer, but uh, a leader in terms of, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm well educated, been, been to a lot of uh, uh, advanced coursework, have advanced degrees, et cetera. And one thing that Rob talked about in terms of, of being a, a leader, uh, I believe that uh, one of, a uh, chief of police uh, told me something once, he said, Jerry, uh, when you have subordinates, people who work uh, with you uh, in the mission or may be uh, in a paramilitary organization, they may, you may outrank them. Um, there are different ways that you have to get them moving uh, in a cohesive way together in the right direction. And, but he said, people will, will manage what you inspect. Uh, and as a manager, uh, if you don't often question, uh, inspect, to verify, what you inadvertently do is communicate to them what's important to you and what's not important to you. And so if I said that we have a mandatory face, facial covering order in place, uh, what, I, what I realize is that people will not follow that order if I don't inspect it, if I don't, so what I, the, the purpose of the compliance teams or the strike teams really is to inspect, to go out to the business and say, uh-oh, this guy is serious. You know, I don't want to have my business shut down. I don't want the government shutting it down. I want to stay open. I want to make money. And so that was the purpose for me to gain, to be proactive in gaining compliance. I didn't uh, uh, attach penalties to it. But the mere fact that they show up, we keep data on it, and we have a list of the bad actors, you don't want to be on that list. Right. So mm -hmm. implicit in that is, yeah, you might want to comply. You might complain. And we have some people who still do not believe the science uh, behind what is, is happening uh, you know, within our state and our nation or across the globe with this pandemic. And they just really do not want to comply. They won't wear, won't wear a mask. They won't socially distance. And they help contribute 
to the spreading of the virus. And we have 405 people who died of the virus in our community. Uh, we have, uh, we're approaching 38,000 individuals who have tested positive for the virus Oof. in our community, a uh, uh, community of about 1.4 million people. Uh, our experience could have been a lot worse if we, if we didn't somehow get this voluntary compliance. So we tried with the hashtag, do your part, and some of the other things that we've done, what we've tried to do is make it fashionable yes. to wear a mask, to make it cool hey. to wear a mask. <laughs> and so yeah. I see Matthew, Matthew is a fashionable guy. Yeah. So he uh -huh. probably has a mask that matches his outfit every day. <laughs> every day and <he's> sleeping. <laughs> and I know the ladies, I know the ladies yep. have yep. a mask that matches the colors that they're wearing. <laughs> and what we did, we drove of uh, the, the willingness of people to voluntarily wear the mask. And by directly doing so, we drove the, uh, the increase and the increase in new cases down as a community. Uh, there were projections done by multiple uh, higher education institutions, uh, universities and research centers around the country that had projected our experience here to be much worse than what it turned out to be. They had projected that we would exceed the capacity of our hospitals, that even more, that 100,000 people uh, would, have, would have died. Well, quite frankly, none of that happened uh, so far. And um, so uh, we had to be decisive in what we did in this community and not worry about the pushback, so to speak. Uh, and so, we have low numbers. I'm happy to say we went from uh, having 20 plus percent uh, positivity rates at one point on a day over day to now uh, less than 5% uh, wow. within the last two weeks, 4.5% wow. positivity rate. So we have some phenomenal numbers that we can report on now. So the truth is in the pudding. You know, yes. is, is, is what, what you're doing is, work, is working. Jessica, um, you. Before I let somebody else ask a question, I'm going to make a suggestion for your committee to bring back to your committee and say it in front of the mayor. <laughs> uh, a do your part fashion show with the mask. Oh. Uh, Fierce Entertainment. Let's, let's, you know, let's just do throw it. that out there. Just throw that out there. <laughs> so, a do your part fashion show. <laughs> we could, uh, maybe we could get the mayor on the runway. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. I have to suggest it to the committee. Yeah, you got to take it up to the committee. I'll, I'll get on it. I'll get on it. <laughs> I approve, Jess. We can do it. <laughs> oh, so, um, Mayor, I do have a question because you did yes. mention fashion, and that's my thing. Um, so, with with him, uh, Bob referencing Orlando International Fashion Week, we do produce that. So, we have a lot of fashionistas following us right now, and probably watching us right now, wondering. So, we see you in these nice suits, but. How, what is your inspiration? How do you dress um, when you're not at work? I'm cool, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, well, I'm not at work. I'm going, I might have on uh, some, uh, I might have them on red and black sneakers with black pants and a black shirt, you know, or yeah. red. You know, I'm, 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 I'm going, my stuff is going to look good. You know, that's what, <laughs> Listen, when I was in uh, when I was in high school and junior high school, they had something. I don't know about your school, but we had something called best dress. Yeah. Now, I, mind you, I was a poor kid, but my mother <laughs> uh, was a seamstress. My mother made some of my clothes. Mm -hmm. So uh, several years, I was uh, nominated and won best dress in my school. Uh, wow. So awesome. I didn't want to look just because I was poor. I didn't want yeah. to look like I was poor, <laughs> you know. I didn't want. It, it was the biggest secret. Nobody knew, man. This guy is poor. As dirt. But uh, but it it got me places, and I think uh, uh, someone mentioned earlier. I think it was Rob about being a role model. Mm -hmm. You don't sign up necessarily to be a role model, but I have some wonderful role models, uh, men and women, uh, who uh, taught me how to dress, how to behave. Uh, how to, if I want respect, then I have to be respectful uh, to others and treat people like I want to be treated. So but the way I dress is related to the image that I am trying to portray, that I'm confident, that I'm a professional, 
Uh, I don't walk around with my pants hanging off my butt, <laughs> showing my underwear. <laughs> and I have three adult sons, and yeah. not one of them dresses that way. Nice. <laughs> Perfect. I do want to say, catering to like the the respect aspect of it, like the integrity of what you do is like you wear a mask. We have other elected officials who don't wear a mask, but they say everything that we need to hear, but they're not following through. But I appreciate what you have to say and what you do with you walking the walk, you talk in the talk, you sound like a duck, you are a duck. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't so know I if I've ever been called a duck or not, but I'm, I got you, Matthew. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> I've been called a lot of things, man. <laughs> <Another duck. laughs> oh, man. Oh, so I could just imagine Jerry and Terry just just dressed down, you know, <laughs> going to school and and and, and Jones. It was, so, I, what's the personality of of your brother? Is he are you guys alike? You know, personality wise, or is he like completely different? Or uh, we're similar. We certainly uh, raised in the same house, believe in some of the same things. Uh, we, my mother, made sure we went to church, so we have this religious upbringing. My brother's a businessman. And, uh, and also a minister, he, he does double duty. Uh, but he, uh, my brother is, is a comedian uh, <laughs> and uh, he's going to tell some jokes and uh, he's a little bit bigger than I am, uh, but he's, uh, he's a funny guy, uh, but he loves to eat. He has a catering business in town and uh, has, uh, made his way. He has a, a wife and, and two adult kids. He has a son and a daughter. Uh, so we, so we, like we, we learn to laugh a lot in our household, you know. And, uh, <laughs> so that's it. Uh, that's cool. That's, oh. laughter, is the key. that's laughter is the key. is the medicine that yeah. cures everything. Um, it makes you forget that you're broke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so My up, twins are the same way. They hang out together. Uh, you know, they're each other's best friends. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah, Jessica and I coming up, we were, you know, military brats. So my dad was a Marine. And so we traveled, you know, all over. We lived in Hawaii, New Orleans, North Carolina. And it was always just us, you know what I mean? And, and uh, yeah. A Marine? Yeah. I yeah. bet you can, make, you can make a bed up, man, yeah. where it's so tight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll show you right now. <laughs> and you want to talk about if I would have walked out the house with my, my butt showing, and you would have saw something. I would have yeah. saw something. <laughs> he, he, didn't he, he didn't play that. He didn't play that. He didn't play that. Those games, you know, everything had to be, you know, dress right dress. So, Absolutely. But, um, yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a good thing. I mean, but like Matthew said, it's, a, it's, a, it's respect. You know, you know, you dress, you respect yourself, you respect the people around you. So um, that's what I learned um, growing up. So I'm gonna let somebody else. I, I know I, I always do all the talking, so I'm gonna let somebody else. Um, <laughs> anybody else have any, any other question, questions? Uh -huh. So what was your inspiration from going from, you know, law enforcement to elected official? Uh, I wanted to bring about change. Uh, and none of these roles, believe it or not, were roles that initially I saw. Uh, people came to me and said, hey, uh, we want you to run for mayor. I'm like, I'm not interested in that. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm like, <laughs> but, um, but my passion is one of service. I, I at this point in life, uh, I, I don't work anymore because I have to work. I'm, I'm fortunate that uh, I can stop working. I'll be just fine. I can pay all of my bills with the, with the uh, income streams that I have. So to me, coming to work uh, for the people uh, is what motivated me. And so uh, remember, this is my home. This is where my family lives, from my 98-year-old father down to my five-year-old granddaughter. So I am immensely concerned about what I see happening in the community around us. So I'm motivated for my grandchildren that this is the, uh, the best places that it can possibly be at this point and not worried about my own selfish uh, successes. You know, being an elected official, it comes with its pluses and its minuses. 
uh, when you are a public official, everybody thinks that they have a right to say whatever they choose to say to you, treat you how, any kind of way. Uh, and, uh, you know, I will tell you because, you know, we uh, work for the people, uh, the right to some extent, but they don't have the right to be disrespectful to, to me. I, I'm always respectful to others. So, uh, so I got recruited to run for mayor. I was recruited to run for sheriff. Uh, I had a job before I ran for sheriff to pay me more money than I, I made as sheriff. Uh, I got recruited in the law enforcement out of a fascination with law enforcement as a child growing up. Uh, the very first deputy sheriff, black deputy sheriff in Orange County uh, was a guy by the name of Louis Crooms. He lived in my neighborhood and I watched him. He had been in the military. This guy was always uh, impeccably dressed uh, and immaculate in his dress. Everything was tight with his uniform. And of course, there were very few of uh, uh, people of color who were uh, in our law enforcement agencies. In fact, the first black deputy wasn't hired until 1963. Uh, the first wow. black Orlando police officer was hired in 1951. And I knew those individuals. So when I got to college, I didn't want to be, I didn't go to college to be a law enforcement officer. I, I initially went to college, uh, I, I was a pre-med major, but I was a poor kid and I was taking all these science courses. And uh, when you're poor, you're like, man, I need to hurry up and get out of here. I'm tired of being broke. <laughs> so I, I changed uh, majors and went into finance and accounting. Uh, and while at uh, Florida State, the CIA, the FBI, and uh, many of the federal agencies did a lot of recruiting at my institution. And uh, with they were looking at that time in the late 70s, uh, they were looking for accountants. And so they, they interview, uh, they requested the interview with uh, those of us who were seniors. And I thought about it. And I said, you know, that might be a cool job. You know, I can do a white collar job, but do blue collar work and get paid some decent money and be a federal agent. So when I went to work as an accountant, I had concurrently applied to go to the FBI and the CIA. And at some point, uh, the federal government went into a hiring freeze. Uh, the economy was in the tank. And uh, a local recruiter uh, at the police department uh, who I knew uh, challenged me to take the entrance exam. And I took it uh, thinking that, well, if I pass this test, uh, if I pass their background, maybe I could get hired with the feds as well. So it was really, I was testing them out. So when they called me and offered, the, offered me the job that made, uh, where I had to take uh, a two thirds pay cut. So that job paid me a third of what I was making when I started there. And I said, not on that job, but I thought about it. I had been traveling, uh, I had a traveling job, so I was on the road, but I thought about it and I decided obviously to, to take that job, but it was only supposed to be for a year while I was waiting to get the call from the the FBI, the CIA, a year down the road or so, I did get that call and I was offered the job. But at that point, I had fallen in love with the local public service and uh, yeah. ultimately met my wife. And I said, you know what, I'm staying. I'll let that go. <laughs> I eventually did go to get to go to the FBI Academy. Uh, wow. but, uh, so I got to realize that in a different wow. way, but, wow. uh, so, you know, just things, the stars lined up perfectly for me. That's, That's awesome. I really appreciate that. Like you treat this as like your backyard taking care of like your grandkids and as well as like your parents. So yeah. what is like the future for you in terms of like the Orlando as, you know, your, your playground as, as is your yard, like, what do you want to do in the future? Well, um, uh, in terms of work, uh, I'm on the downside of work life, you know, where, I, where I'm working for 
a living uh, uh, where I'm getting paid to work. But uh, before I stopped, uh, in the words of Walt Disney, Walt Disney said that he wanted to create this experimental prototype community of tomorrow where uh, there would be this innovation meeting technology, culture, entertainment, and diverse experience where there would be clean energy, um, multimodal systems of transportation. And so he had that vision. So uh, as a teenager from working at Walt Disney, I got to see Walt Disney in uh, the early stages and what Disney ultimately became here. So if I, if to me, if we can take the backdrop of, if, I know all of you have been to Disney, it's clean, you got a monorail, you got a ferry, your steamboat, you got all kinds of modes of transportation, all kinds of Everything. entertainment, and culture, <laughs> food. Yes. So I said, wow, if the entire Orange County could be that experience, wow. Wow. that's what I'm trying to make to where we have, uh, today I had a conference call with a company that's looking at flying uh, automobiles <laughs> and they want to use this as a test bed like the Jetsons uh, you yeah. know uh, so this is uh, being part of that that futuristic kind of look for uh, Orlando and Orange County to get to play in that arena is just fantastic uh, to to have influence so it's not power that I've ever been after it's influence the influence the trajectory of my community. And that's why I'm highly motivated and excited every day uh, to, to do what I do and meet people like you all in that process and try to understand your vision, uh, kind of tell you about my vision and how those visions can come together uh, to make this place just a dynamite place to live. I think that's like an amazing thing. Like definitely like with Fierce Entertainment, like our vision is definitely trying to be innovative and like moving forward and trying to do new things that, you know, other people haven't done before. And I think that's like a really great opportunity for us to like to mesh with you. And I know Rob wants to drive one of those like flying cars. So I'm yeah. going to, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to volunteer him to do one of those. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm with it. I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally with that. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe, for all this time. I know yeah. that um, it's Friday night. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, I, I got, I got um, two more, two more questions, Mary. I mean, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll let you go. Uh, um, I'll, okay. So, because you mentioned your your wife again, and and um, you know, we have to ask. I, I, I'm just curious. You know, she's been in the conversation to be the VP of the of the United States. And so she was like, you know, right there. And and what happened? I think the 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 nation got to know who she is, you know what I mean? And I'm, I'm, you know, Kamala, I like Kamala, support Kamala also, you know, Val, Val was my definitely first, my first choice because I know her, you know what I mean? I, I know her and, and especially the time that we're in right now with, you know, you know, people having issues trusting the police and her being a police, you know, from the police, Trump is from the police system. Um, I think, she, and, and being a mother and, and all of those things, so she was right there. She was right there. Yeah. So she was my, my first choice. But, you know, in the back of my head, I was always curious. So what would that mean for you? What would that mean for our mayor? You know, you would have been the second husband. <laughs> what, would, what would that look like for you? <laughs> well, uh, first, let me just say, um, it was an incredible honor for her to come close to being selected to be uh, the nominee for vice president of the United States. It's over 300 million Americans. Uh, only uh, 435 serve in the United States House of Representatives and another 100 serve in the Senate. 535 Americans serve in the United States Congress. And for her to be one of them is, I think, extraordinary. Yeah. And then to be one uh, of just uh, probably, in terms of serious contenders, probably was five or less for her to be in that number was extraordinary. Uh, so uh, what it would have meant for our family was, uh, while she and I have these high profile positions, my children uh, uh, have uh, been allowed to have a certain amount of anonymity. My grandchildren 
have a certain amount of anonymity. The fear I had for them was uh, them losing that anonymity. But we, of course, had those conversations about what would that mean for our families because of the crazies in the world around us. Just yeah. by the mere fact that she was being vetted, uh, there were, uh, I became more concerned about the safety and security of, of my family because of the threats of uh, the mean spirited people, the evil people in the world. Yeah. Uh, as while she had many people that supported her, uh, there were many who did not because of the politics associated with it. For me, what it would have meant was I made a commitment that uh, when I ran for mayor that I would uh, fulfill that term, that I would work for the people. So I said that regardless of what happens, if she had been selected and if she had been elected uh, to serve in, uh, uh, in the administration, uh, I would have continued to be the mayor here. It would have created some some interesting nuances, but I would have continued my service here, and I would have went there. I go there now. You know, we have a condo there in Washington D.C. Uh, since COVID occurred, I don't, I, I have not been able to go there as often as I was going there. Uh, but uh, we are very strong in our faith. Uh, we're strong in our relationship. And I think that uh, if you don't have a strong relationship, don't, don't do this stuff because right. <laughs> it'll rip you apart. So um, I would have leveraged the relationship with her and the other members of Congress for the benefit of the people who live here. Uh, and I, which is what I do now because through her relationships in Washington, D.C., I have relationships there where I can pick up the phone and call some people in some pretty influential positions and they will right. take my call. They won't say, Mayor, who or where is it? No, right. they will know, they will take my call because I have a personal relationship. So I think in, right. in business, sometimes in life, uh, your success is defined by the people in your circle, uh, your sphere of influence. And so uh, I become much more influential with that circle uh, of that sphere of influence. And so you all, uh, part of the reason why we're having this conversation today is uh, you are building and, and you, your, your sphere of influence. Uh, you can say, well, I, I, I know Mayor Demings. I can pick up the phone and call him. He's going to take my call because I got to introduce him. It was a personable a conversation and vice versa. If I'm looking for someone to do something in the community and I'm looking for a certain skill sets or relationships, I say, you know what, let, let, let me call uh, Rob Henlon. Let, let, let me call him uh, because I think he's the right guy that can do that. Uh, and so that's what it's all about, uh, right? It's building these relationships. Okay. So that's what it would have meant for my wife to, uh, to have served uh, in that role. And who knows? We also, I said, we are strong in our faith. We do believe that what God has for you, God has for you. And if the fact that she didn't get it while there was much disappointment, it just means that that's a setup for something else that God has for her. And we have to Absolutely. Uh, humble ourselves uh, to, yeah. to that as well. Wow. Well, Mayor Demi, well, I'm going to let you go, but um, you mentioned influence. And like I said, once again, uh, my background is management and leadership. And I, the idea is when I graduated from uh, Webster University uh, with my master's, and, and Val was actually the guest speaker. She was the speaker, the honorary <laughs> speaker at my graduation. And I think she she's got the, her uh, master's at Webster. Yeah, she got her master's too, right? Yeah. So she came back. <laughs> they brought her back to, um, to speak at my graduation. But what well, we learned, you know, anybody who studied leadership, influence, the word that you use is, is leadership. Leadership is influence. So that, that's amazing. Um, the last thing I'm going to leave well, is, is a question, sir. You don't have to answer it, but it's a, re it's a request more like, if you please ask Val to run for governor. You don't have to say anything, but I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there. Did just you say ask her to run for what? Governor. 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 <laughs> Governor of She's heard that so much. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I don't know what the future holds for her in that regard. 
But uh, what I can tell you, she's well suited for Washington uh, yeah. and the politics of Washington, D.C. Yeah. Nice. And uh, I don't know what that means for her. Uh, uh, you know, they people sometimes see you in a place before you see yourself there, mm -hmm. and that's that, yeah. that has happened to both of us. Uh, right. You know, in our lives, uh, you know, as as God has enlarged our territory, uh, to enlarge His territory, uh, we'll see. <laughs> you know, we'll we'll leave it at that. We, you know, and uh, we're not getting any younger either. <laughs> you know, uh, so sometimes I'm like, man, you, but these people who are running for president now, they're in their late 70s, man. I don't know that I want to be doing that that long, you know. Hey, so 60 is the new 40. Come on. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, well. But thank you so much, Mayor Demi. Thank you for your time. Thank you for, yeah. you know, sharing with us. Uh, and we thank you guys at home for watching. Um, we hope that you all stay healthy, stay safe, and stay fierce. Thank you all. Be blessed. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thanks for watching. You can catch us live every Friday at 6 o'clock. And don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button. Stay healthy, stay safe, and stay fierce.